The Art of Living Consciously The Power of Awareness to Transform Everyday Life By Nathaniel Brandon, Part 1 Introduction A few months after completing my previous book, Taking Responsibility, I was at a dinner party, and someone asked me what I was writing next. I answered that I was about to embark on a book that would examine what it means to live consciously. An older woman, her face lined with bitterness, frowned and shook her head disapprovingly. Live consciously, she said. Not a good idea. Who would want to live consciously? Life would be too painful. I asked, is it less painful if we live unconsciously and mechanically, without knowing what we are doing, and blind to opportunities to make things better? But she did not answer. Someone else at the table remarked, well, even if living consciously does have advantages isn't it still a lot of work? Like a light that can he turned brighter or dimmer, consciousness exists on a continuum. It is true that living consciously obliges us at times to confront painful realities. It is also true that it demands an effort. As a way of operating in the world, living consciously has its costs, and we will examine them. A central theme of this book, however, is that the rewards are overwhelmingly greater than any apparent drawback. Living consciously is a source of power and liberation. It does not weigh us down it lifts us up. Like a light that can be turned brighter or dimmer, consciousness exists on a continuum. We can be more conscious or less conscious, more aware or less aware. So the choice is not between absolute optimal consciousness and literal unconsciousness, as in a coma. The choice is between living more consciously and less consciously. Or we might say, between living consciously and live ing mechanically. And it is always a matter of degree. The tragedy of so many people is precisely that, to a great extent, they live mechanically, their thinking is stale, they don't examine their motives, and they respond to events automatically. They rarely take a fresh look at anything and rarely have a new thought. They exist at a low or shallow level of awareness. One of the consequences is that they live lives drained of color, excitement, or passion. It is not difficult to see that consciousness energizes, while its absence produces boredom and enervation. To live consciously is to be committed to awareness as a way of being in the world and to bring to each activity a level of awareness appropriate to it. But what this means is not obvious. Living consciously is an enormous abstraction. We will examine its meaning in the chapters that follow. I use consciousness here in its primary meaning, the state of being conscious or aware of some aspect of reality. Why is consciousness important? The short answer is that for all species that possess it, consciousness is the basic tool of survival and of adaptation to reality the ability to be aware of the environment in some way, at some level, and to guide action accordingly. One might as well ask, why is sight important? The issue of living consciously versus unconsciously takes many forms. Here are two examples taken from my practice of psychotherapy, in which we can see what living unconsciously may look like. Note that these examples merely illustrate the problem, they do not yet suggest the path to a solution. Arnold Kay was a 47-year-old professor of history who imagined he was deeply in love with his wife and was unkind to her in a hundred ways he did not notice. When she needed to talk to him about something of importance to her, he typically was preoccupied, only half listened, and rarely responded in any meaningful way. When she expressed a desire, he smiled and said noth ing and soon drifted off to another subject. When she disagreed with him, he swung off into another monologue without dealing with what she had said. When she tried to tell him of ways he hurt her, he did not hear, or apologized instantly and forgot her words within an hour. He knew how devoted he felt, so he believed he was a loving husband. And when the mood struck, he could be truly generous, considerate, and caring. Essentially, however, he lived in a private cocoon that contained himself and his love for her and his image of her but not the actual woman, she was exiled to that foreign realm, reality. So that in real-world terms, she was not part of his marriage. 
His wife was not the woman he lived with, he lived with a fantasy existing only inside his head. In some subjective sense of his own he may have loved her, but he did not love her consciously, did not day by day give the relationship the awareness it needed and deserved. Eventually she became ill and abruptly was gone from his life. Standing at her graveside in agony, he saw that during the twelve years of their marriage he had not been there he had been lost inside his own mind. He saw that he had abandoned his wife long before she had abandoned him by dying. What love had not accomplished, death had accomplished, jolted him into waking up, at least for a time. For many of us, suffering is the only teacher to whom we listen. In Arnold's case, as with the case below, suffering precipitated the decision to seek psychotherapy. Rebecca L. was a 39-year-old leader of personal growth workshops. She saw herself as a person who was on a spiritual path and who had attained a high level of consciousness, yet she was oblivious to the wreckage she had created in her family life. Her lofty view of herself was based on the fact that she was a student of the I Ching, took classes in Tantric Yoga, immersed herself in the L literature of the contemplative traditions, and had had 13 years of Jungian analysis. She subjected her two teenage daughters to endless hours of psychological interpretation of their behavior. At dinner she would invite her husband to tell his dreams, which she would then proceed to analyze. If any of her interpretations were challenged, she would respond with gentle compassion, if the challenge persisted, she became first irritated and then increasingly angry until everyone retreated into sullen exhaustion. She could quote interminably from many spiritual masters and had no idea that in the privacy of their bedroom her daughters would sometimes talk about how pleasant life could be if only mother would die. Her husband did not appear to indulge in daydreams, he merely barricaded himself behind his work and spent as little time alone with her as possible. She moved through her life in a kind of trance while priding herself on being more awake, more con -sious. than those around her. She could not understand why she so often felt a vague, generalized anxiety. Neither of these people was asleep in the literal sense, and neither was awake in the sense required for a successful life. Their stories give us a preliminary sense of the territory we need to explore or, more precisely, certain aspects of it, we will see that there are many others. Sometimes, when we reflect on our life and on the mistakes we have made and regretted, it seems to us we were sleeping when we imagined we were awake. We wonder how we could have failed to see that which now stands out in such bold relief. Of course, this may be self-deceiving, in that hindsight always sees more clearly. At that earlier time, we may have been as conscious as we knew how to be. However, sometimes our sense of having been sleepwalking through our existence reflects an accurate assessment. We know we were not mindful when we needed to be. Our awareness was diffuse or distracted rather than focused and disciplined. No doubt there were reasons, but reasons do not alter facts. In retrospect, we wish we had been more conscious. We think, for example, of all the danger signals we had ignored at the start of what turned out to be a disastrous love affair for example, our lover's incongruous behavior, conflicting statements, mysterious non-explanations, sudden and inexplicable emotional outbursts. We ask ourselves, where was my mind at the time? Or we remember all the warnings our supervisor gave us long before we were discharged, and we wonder why the words did not peen trait. Or we reflect on the opportunities we let slip by because in our trance-like state we did not appreciate them for what they were, and we ask ourselves how that was possible. Where was I, we wonder, when my life was happening? When I discussed the practice of living consciously in previous books, it was exclusively from the perspective of its importance to self-esteem. Here, the focus is wider. What does it mean to act consciously? To love consciously? To parent consciously? To feel consciously? To work consciously? To struggle consciously? To vote consciously? To legislate consciously? To address the great issues of life consciously? To offer an example from the political realm, 
when legislators pass laws on the expediency of the moment, such as price and wage controls, without thinking through the long-term, foresee, able consequences of their programs, which unfortunately is the pattern of most legislation and the results are worse than the problem the legislation promised to correct, which is so often the case an entire nation pays the price for that lack of apro, pride consciousness, and conscientiousness, point one almost all of us tend to operate more consciously in some areas than in others. We may bring great consciousness to our work and very little to our personal relationships or vice versa. We may think far more clearly about our careers than about our political beliefs or vice versa. We may maintain a high level of mental focus in matters pertaining to our health and a low level in matters pertaining to ethics or religion or vice versa. In this book, I examine what operating consciously means across the broad spectrum of human concerns from dealing with our most intimate emotions, to pursuing a career, to falling in love, to sustaining a marriage, to rearing children, to meeting the chow, lungs of the workplace, to choosing the values that guide our actions, to understanding what self-esteem depends on, to weighing the claims offered by religion and mysticism. With regard to this last, for many years my readers have been asking me how my concept of living consciously relates to issues of spirituality, religion, mysticism, and the ethical teachings associated with mysticism, and I am happy to have an opportunity to answer them in print. For those with this particular interest, chapters I and May 7 be read as a self-contained unit. Our need to live consciously, with the meaning I develop in this book, is intrinsic to the human condition. But it has acquired a new urgency in the modern age. The more rapid the rate of change, the more dangerous it is to live mechanically, relying on routines of belief and behavior that may be irrelevant or obsolete. Further, old structures and old traditions are falling away. The voices of official authority grow ever fainter and command less and less respect. Our culture seems to have dissolved or exploded into 10,000 mutually adversarial subcultures. Even commit, TED conformists are finding it increasingly difficult to know what to conform to, so splintered and fragmented has our world become. We are obl egate to choose the values by which we live. We are obliged to choose more and more aspects of our existence, from where we reside to what career we pursue to what lifestyle we select to what religion or philosophy we embrace. In earlier periods of our history, we were born into societies where all these choices were, figuratively, made for us by custom and tradition that is, by people who lived before us. Boo that time is gone and will not come again. Today we are exposed to an unprecedented amount of information and an unprecedented number of options. We are thrown on our own resources as never before. And we have nothing to protect us but the clarity of our thinking. The fact that we have evolved from an agricultural economy to a manufacturing economy to an information economy has its own powerful implications for the value of living consciously. The age of the muscle worker is past, this is the age of the mind worker. That our mind is our basic tool of survival is not new, what is new is that this fact has become inescapably clear. The market is rapidly diminishing for people who have nothing to contribute but fissy, cal labor. In an economy in which knowledge, information, creativity and their translation into innovation are the prime source of wealth, what is needed above all is minds. What is needed are people who are willing and able to think. If we wish to remain adaptive, we must be committed to continuous learning as a way of life. And since knowledge is growing at a rate unprecedented in human history, and the training we received yesterday is in aid, quite to the requirements of tomorrow, if we wish to remain adaptive, we must be committed to continuous learning as a way of life. Today, this is one of the meanings of living consciously. Whether our focus is on preserving and strengthening family ties in a world of increasingly unstable human relationships, or on gaining access to a decent job, or on growing and evolving as a person, or on guiding a company through the stormy seas of a fiercely competitive global marketplace whether our goals are material, emotional, or spiritual the price of success is the same, consciousness, thinking, learning.
To be asleep at the wheel to rely only on the known, familiar, and automatized is to invite disaster. We have entered the mind millennium. This book is a wake-up call. Living Consciously, First Principles Living consciously has its roots in respect for reality a respect for facts and truth. In this chapter, we will explore what this means. Let me say at the outset that no one is born with this reality orientation. It must be learned. Its full realization represents an achievement and unfortunately, roadblocks are often thrown in a child's way. Instead of supporting a child's natural impulse to grow in awareness and cognitive maturity, adults acting out their own problems may behave in ways that tempt a child not to open his or her eyes wider but to shut them. Being a child can be very difficult. One commonly witnesses adult behavior that is frightening, bewildering, inexplicable. One cannot make sense of it. Confidence in one's mind may be subvert. One sense of reality may be undercut. Consciousness may be experienced as futile or even dangerous. Mother, for example, gives a solemn talk on the importance of honesty. Then guests arrive, and mother makes statements to them the child knows to be untrue. The child searches mother's face for a hint that might dissolve this mystery. Mother looks back at him, her face guileless and guiltless, and not a word of explanation is offered, then or later. The hypocrisy the contradiction is a fact treated as a non-fact. Or a child sits at the dinner table with her mother and two brothers, and mother is talking to them pleasantly and does not turn her head when father staggers toward them, reeking of alcohol and stumbling as he advances. Father pulls out a chair, misses it, and hits the floor instead, where he remains, half lying, half sitting. And mother goes on talking as if nothing had happened, which is her characteristic response whenever anything unpleasant takes place. The child's eyes swing from father to mother to the two brothers and then back to father again. But no acknowledgement of father's state is made by anyone. The message is clear, a fact that one denies, evades, is not a fact. Or a child cannot understand why teacher so often ridicules her over the smallest mistakes or speaks to her in a voice heavy with sarcasm this same teacher who speaks so often about the importance of addressing everyone with courtesy and respect. Don't you like me? The child gathers the courage to ask, and the teacher replies, her eyes glittering with irritation, I love all my students. The child does not dare to push further by saying, then why do you make us all afraid of you? The child knows this is a question that will never be answered, she will merely be offered another lie and perhaps another sarcastic reproach. Truth is expendable in a game whose rules are never stated. Inside the minds of children such as these a deeper question struck glees inarticulately but is never asked, how am I to live in your world? And inside that question are other questions. How am I to know what to believe if you don't mean what you say or say what you mean? How can I trust if I never know when I am being lied to? How can I feel safe if facts are not treated as facts? And with you as my guide, how I am even to understand? How am I to know what anything is? And if I can't know how am I to live? Children need love, true enough, but they also need the experience of living in a rational universe. The danger to a child confronted with human irrationality is that he or she will surrender the will to understand the will to make sense out of experience. The child may give up the belief that thinking is worthwhile. Children need love, true enough, but they also need the expiry, ints of living in a rational universe. And it is just this experience that too many parents fail to provide. By a rational universe, I mean an environment in which facts are treated as facts, truth is respected, question asking is valued, not punished, and people do not permit themselves contradictions and do not assail others with conflicting messages. I mean an environment in which adults speak to a child's mind, not to his or her fears and in which a child's desire to understand is honored and nurtured. Living consciously is a challenge for all of us even when there is no trauma to overcome. 
Sometimes the assaults on a child's will to understand are not ing more than the familiar adult irrationalities of everyday life, the broken promises, the contradictory injunctions, the denial of obvious truths. Sometimes, however, the assaults are more dramatic. I remember an incident many years ago when I was treating a woman who had been sexually molested by her father when she was five years old. Under hypnosis she partially relived the experience, I wanted to learn the silent thoughts that had a calm ponied the episode. What impressed me most was the focus of the trauma. It was not on the pain or even the sense of violation, per se. It was the inability to comprehend how her father could be doing such a thing. He's my daddy, Eleven she kept saying. How can he be doing this? Later, out of hypnosis, she remarked, that was the worst horror that the experience totally blew up any notion I had of reason or sanity. What daddy was doing was impossible. Yet he was doing it. The trauma was compounded when she tried to tell her mother what had happened, her mother kept moving about the kitchen, doing small chores and muttering pleasantly some variant of, your father and I love you, and, no need to make yourself unhappy. Her father's demeanor reflected not a trace of what had taken place between them. The crime against the child's body was less than the crime against her mind. In therapy, it was easier to awaken my client's interest in new relationships than to awaken her interest in living consciously, she had spent too many years surviving by keeping the light of awareness turned down to a tolerable level of dimness. To turn that light up was a challenge. However, we will see that even when there is no trauma to overcome, to live consciously is a challenge for all of us. Acquiring a sense of reality. To live consciously, we need to develop what I call, a sense of reality. What does this idea entail? Right now, you are holding a book in your hands. You are secure in the knowledge that the book will not suddenly turn into a telephone or a cup of coffee. If you close the book and go for a walk, you are secure in the knowledge that your home will not turn into an automobile in your absence. You know that change is possible to the book or your home, of course for example, if your dog chews the book up or if a hurricane hits your home but you are secure in the knowledge that those changes will be lawful, in accordance with the nature of the materials of which the book and your home are made. The book may be chewed up, but it will not turn into ice cream. Your house may be destroyed, but it will not be transformed into a bicycle. If we are able to move through reality with some measure of assurance, the ultimate, metaphysi, cal, a root of our certainty is the knowledge that things are what they are. In philosophy, this principle is known as the law of identity. A is A. A thing is itself. This is at once the ultimate statement about existence and the first law of logic. The law of identity gives birth to the law of causality, a thing must act in accordance with its nature. In any given set of circumstances, what it will do is determine caused by what it is. Point one, although the above examples do involve physical entities, a thing need not be a physical object. A thing used here as an equivalent to an existent can be an entity, an attribute, an action, a thought, an intention, an inner emotional state, a form of energy, whatever is. Ultimately, any security we feel in this world, any sense of living in a stable universe, is traceable to the axiom of identity. It is so intrinsic to all our experience that we never think about it explic, itly, unless we are philosophers. But it is the foundation of every thing. What is, is, what is not, is not. Nothing is more certain, and nothing is more fundamental. This said, let us reflect briefly on two concepts that underlie all our others and are the most basic of all, existence and non-existence. Or, in simpler language, something and nothing. To be, is to be something. The concept of something applies to every concept in your mind, to the entire content of your consciousness, and to the total of your knowledge, regardless of the amount or degree of your null edge. It is the fundamental concept of consciousness it marks the start of being conscious. When a baby opens its eyes and receives its first sensations of sight or sound, 
all that its consciousness can register is awareness of something. The baby does not know what it is and does not yet possess any concepts, but we who are adults know that the concept of something names the first state and stage of the baby's awareness. The blob of light he senses is something. The sound she hears is something. The blanket he touches is some thing. To be conscious is to be conscious of something. In the development of a baby's consciousness, the next step after the grasping of something is the ability to perceive entities. This is made possible by the ability of the brain and nervous system to retain and integrate disparate sensations. Point two it is with this ability that knowledge proper begins. That which does not exist is not ing. We often use the concept of nothing to convey the absence of specific things. We say, I have nothing in my pocket, meaning there are no physical objects in my pocket. Or we say, the amount of my fortune is zero, meaning I have no money. But the metaphysical meaning of noth, ing, is non-existence. The literal void. The blank. The zero. Non-existence does not exist. Nothing is a concept pertaining exclusively to a relation, it has meaning only in relation to something and denotes its absence. Nothing by itself is nothing. It is not just another kind of something. One expression of a sense of reality is the ability to grasp this simple fact. There is a tendency in mystical literature to treat nothing or emptiness as a superior kind of something. To be something means to be something specific, as distant guished from the blank of nothing. To be something specific means to be an existent of a certain kind, a certain nature, a certain identity. The identity of a thing is that which it is. And that which it is, it is. A rock is a rock. An electron is an electron. A fleeting feeling is a fleeting feeling. An unachieved ambition is an unachieved ambition. This inescapable truth is the basis of the laws of logic and of all rational thought. Defy it and thought has no coherence. Attempt to argue against it and one will still find oneself counting on it, as in the premise that one's claim is one's claim and not the opposite. Not to possess an identity, not to possess a nature, not to be anything in particular, means not to be anything, which means not to exist. To be, is to be something. In the field of logic, the law of identity has a corollary, a calm, panion principle it immediately entails. The law of non-contradic, tie-in states that nothing can be a and not a at the same time and in the same respect. Nothing can be an attribute and not an attribute, true and not true, a fact and not a fact, at the same time and in the same respect. A rug cannot be white and not white, a proposi tie-in cannot be true and false, an event cannot be happening and not happening, at the same time and in the same respect. If we know anything, we know this. It is intrinsic to the act of being conscious that is, aware of reality. Point three to arrive at a contradiction is to know that we have made an error in our thinking. An example of a contradiction would be the claim that one has seen two mountains side by side without a valley between them. Or that one is a thoroughly honest politician who lies only when it is necessary to be elected. Or that one is absolutely certain that no one can know anything with certainty. Rationalists, of whom there are many today, may wish to maintain a contradiction and call it a higher level of knowledge. But the truth is, they have undercut that which makes knowledge possible. To persist in contradiction is to short-circuit consciousness itself. But then what is left in its stead? This issue is examined further in Chapter 7, Consciousness and Spirituality. What confuses some people about this issue and allows them to imagine that contradictions are possible is that they do not pay sufficient attention to the qualifier, at the same time and in the same respect. Aristotle, the father of logic, was very precise in these matters. People say, for example, Mr. B is self-responsible at work but very irresponsible in his personal life. So he is and is not self-responsible. Therefore, contradictions are possible. 
The error here is that this is not a contradiction not if one factors in time and respect. With greater prec 1s1 on, we say, Mr. B, is self-responsible in some contexts but not in others. He is self-responsible some of the time, when he is operating his business, and irresponsible at other times, in the conduct of his personal life. Sometimes we believe two statements are contradictory and later discover they are not, by expanding our knowledge to include a frame of reference in which a seeming incompatibility dissolves. For example, a person with only a limited understanding of the terms religious and spiritual might assume it is contradictory to say, he is not religious, although he is very spiritual. A deeper understanding, however, would disclose that the presumed contradiction is only illusory. Consider what contradictions mean in action. For example, consider the impact on a child's mind who receives the following parental messages. I, we want you to be independent and learn to think for yourself, 2, we want you to obey our instructions and never question our judgment, 3, you are never to raise or discuss the discrepancy between the first injunction and the second. Stu, dents of development observe that this is one of the ways one destroys a consciousness before it is fully matured. And for this reason, it is difficult to think kindly of a parent who might re-spond, I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. Most people are unaware that their thinking and value system may be riddled with contradictions. Here are other instances of teachings that do violence to a young mind as a and not a fight to occupy the same space, ours is a god of love and infinite benevolence, and if you do not embrace him, he will make you burn forever in hell. Don't ask questions, don't try to understand be reasonable. It is a virtue to be thrifty, industrious, and hardworking, but if you commit the sin of succeeding, remember that it will be easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Sex is dirty, rotten, and disgusting, and you should save it for your husband. Most people, of course, do not embrace contradictions righteously. They are unaware they have them, unaware their thinking and value system may be riddled with them. That is why they are so often morally confused as to the proper course of action. One of the most common forms in which people confront contradictions in everyday life is when their official view of themselves, their self-concept, clashes with some aspect of their behavior. In such a situation, they have three alternatives, they can revise their self-concept. They can change their behavior. Or they can evade the contradiction. The third option seems the most popular, perhaps because up, tie-ins 1 and 2 can be difficult. In such cases, the motive is to protect the evader's self-esteem, or their pretense at it. But in fact they undermine self-esteem, because at a deeper level they know what they are doing. Evasion may deceive the conscious mind, it does not deceive the subconscious mind. Somewhere there is the knowledge, I am at odds with reality. I hold myself together by avoidance and denial. Point four to offer an example from the wider, social sphere, we can observe that governments are notorious for pursuing contradictory policies. Example, waging a campaign against smoking while pro veeding agricultural subsidies for tobacco growers. Indeed, it would be a major step toward cleaning up our legislative and regulatory mess if it were made a matter of law that contradictory policies could not be tolerated one or the other, or both, had to be rescinded. In every domain, the law of non-contradiction is an effect, tithe broom for sweeping up refuse. We undermine our self-esteem when we persist in our contradictions, because at a deeper level we know what we are doing. The laws of identity and non-contradiction are more than princey, pleas of logic, they are protectors of our sanity. Ignore them and we eject ourselves from reality. More than a few philosophers have broken themselves against these laws when attempting to argue that such principles are not immutable facts but mere conventions or no more than merely probable. They inevitably expose themselves to the rebuttal that they are presupposing that which they wish to attack, they are obliged to count on these principles, use them, implicitly accept their truth in any attempt to defeat them. 
No amount of intellect, tool squirming can efface the fact that when one makes any asser, tie-in, one implies that one's assertion is what it is and not the opposite and that if one's position is true, it is not simultaneously and in the same respect false. The laws of identity and non-contradiction cannot be escaped. Further, with regard to the objectivity of truth, if A is A, if facts are facts, then things are what they are regardless of our agreement, knowledge, or belief. If something is a fact, our ignorance of it or our refusal to see it does not render it a non-fact. That which exists is what it is, independent of anyone's knowledge, judgment, beliefs, hopes, wishes, or fears. And this applies fully as much to internal facts as to external ones, if I am feeling something say, fear, hurt, anger, envy, lust I am feeling it, whether or not I admit it. Reality is that which exists, and the function of consciousness is to perceive it. Reality is the object of consciousness the object that consciousness perceives and must learn to perceive correctly, 5 thus, if I am an embezzler, I am an embezzler that is reality whether or not my crime is ever discovered. If I have appropriated the achievements of another and claimed them as my own, then I am a fraud that is a fact no matter how much the world acclaims me. If my partner becomes addicted to drugs, then that is her condition that's the way things are whether or not I ever admit it to myself. If I dislike being a parent, that is the truth of my feelings that is reality no matter how passionately I tell myself otherwise. If a new discovery contradicts and disconfirms my beliefs in some area, that is a fact that is what is so regard less of whether or not I choose to think about it. If I live consciously, I do not attempt to evade facts, I do not imagine that blindness annihilates existence. In aligning ourselves with reality as best we understand it, we optimize our chances for success. Living consciously reflects the understanding that since we live in reality and must adapt to it if we are to survive and flourish, our first responsibility is to see clearly that which bears on our existence and well-being more specifically, on our actions, inter -ests, needs, values, and goals. The purpose of such sight is to guide behavior accordingly. Living consciously reflects the recognition that, in aligning ourselves with reality as best we understand it, we optimize our chances for success and that in setting ourselves against reality, we condemn ourselves to failure and possibly destruction. With respect to this second policy, consider the person who refuses to confront the unsolved problems in his marriage on the implicit premise that if we don't talk about them, they won't exist whose partner finally gives up in despair and leaves, or the person who dies from a disease because she refused to admit the reality of the disease and the need for treatment, on the often explicit premise that all sickness is an illusion and that so long as I don't believe I'm sick, I'll remain healthy. That our beliefs can sometimes affect the course of an illness is an entirely different matter that in no way contradicts the point being made here. Living consciously reflects the conviction that sight is preferable to blindness, that respect for the facts of reality yields more satisfying results than defiance of the facts of reality, that evasion does not make the unreal real or the real unreal, that I am better served by correcting my mistakes than by pretending they do not exist, and that the more conscious I am of facts bearing on my life and goals, the more wisely and effectively I can act. All of these interwoven realizations are what I mean by a sense of reality. They are the rock on which a conscious life stands. Awareness, outer and inner. Our inner world, too, is part of reality. When we begin to reflect on what it means to live consciously, we may find ourselves thinking in terms of paying attention to our environment, seeking to understand the world around us, looking for evidence that tells us if we are right or mistaken in our assumptions, searching out information that bears on our goals, learning more about our work, and other matters pertaining to the world external to self. That is all correct, but it is only half the story. The other half of living consciously has to do with self-awareness, with a concern to understand the inner world of needs, motives, thoughts, mental states, emotions, and bodily feelings. If the essence of rationality is respect for the facts of reality, 
that must include the facts of one's own being. Our inner world, too, is part of reality. Mind is as real as matter. No one can be said to be living consciously who exempts self-awareness and self-examination from the agenda. We all know people who are full of information about the external world and may be very observant in certain situations but who are utterly oblivious to their inner processes and the meaning of those processes. These people exist in an acute state of alienation. They have no interest concerning their own inner world the world of needs, emotions which often makes them in effect tithe in the external, social, world. If we are to function effectively, we must learn to look in two directions to preserve contact with the world and with the self. For example, if we are to achieve some particular goal, we need to know the objective requirements of a given situation and its emo, tional meaning to us. We need to know the facts and our appraisal of the facts. We need to know what we must do and what we feel about what we must do. In the literal moment of action, we may not choose to focus on our feelings, or we may, depending on circumstances, but as a rule, it is dangerous to be oblivious to the personal significance of situations. Such information can help us navigate appropriately. If we are to function effectively, we must learn to look in two directions, to preserve contact with the world and with the self. When a person decides, as a basic pattern of behavior, to disregard external reality when it suits him or her and surrender to the control of feelings, the chief feeling left to experience is an anxiety. If we choose to move through life blindly, we have good reason to be afraid. To some extent this was the problem of Rebecca L., whose self-absorption made her oblivious to the effect of her behavior on her family or the hostility she endured. Her anxiety was her organism's alarm signal, warning her of danger. When a person decides, as a general policy, to cut off contact with emotions in order to function effectively in external reality, he or she sabotages the ability to think in key areas. If we disconnect from our personal context, we cannot then operate rationally in the personal realm, we have lost the knowledge of what things mean to us. If we choose to move through life blindly, we have good reason to be afraid. What we are blind to in the world tends to reflect what we are blind to in ourselves. A person who denies the presence of a need tends to be blind to opportunities to satisfy that need as, for instance, when a person denies his need and desire for companionship, suffers loneliness, and does not see opportunities for friendship. A person who denies the reality of her pain tends to be oblivious to the source of the pain and continually exposes herself to new hurt as when a woman repeatedly subjects herself to exploitative and enervating encounters with men. A person who guiltily disowns certain of his desires may, via the mechanism of projection, attribute them to others as when we refuse to wreck agnize our feelings of envy while falsely attributing them to others. The point is, awareness must flow freely in both directions or it will flow freely in neither. We will look at this issue in more detail in our discussion of reason and emotion. However, I want to relate two stories here that will add some preliminary clarification concerning the relationship between consciousness of the outer and consciousness of the inner. Roughly 25 years ago I was invited to address a confer, ins whose theme was, dealing with the gifted child. The opening statement of my address was something like, Ladies and gentlemen, parents and teachers, if you will go back in memory into your own childhood and connect with what you longed for from adults and perhaps did not get, you will know what the children entrusted to your care need from you. Then I went on to talk about what it was like to be a child, and what are often a child's frustrations, and what are a child's legitimate needs, in such a way as to stimulate the flow of feeling and memory within my listeners. I was aware that when we are hurt as children we often turn off, repress feeling, to make life bearable. Years later, when we have children of our own, childhood can seem an incomprehensible world. The result is that we are badly hampered in our efforts to see what needs to be seen and do what needs to be done. We are blind to the child we once were and blind to the child in front of us. The problem is, more often than not we do not know we are blind. 
For this reason, I knew that empathy had to begin with self-awareness with our inner reality and with the remembered experience of our own childhood. And in the discus, shown following my presentation, I was heartened to witness the number of spontaneous insights concerning what actions to take that members of the audience began sharing. In recalling what they had needed as children, they began to understand better what other children need. I must add that while self-awareness was necessary, it was not all these parents and teachers required. Since every human being is unique, they needed to listen to these children and learn from them what might be most helpful in any particular case. Otherwise, the danger would be of projecting one's own preferences onto a child whom they did not fit. They needed to integrate inner and outer awareness. The next story took place a year or two earlier than the above incident. In my early 40s, I decided I wanted to experience a form of body therapy known as structural integration, or, more popularly, rolfing, after the originator of the method, Ida Rolf. This process involves deep massage and manipulation of the muse, CLE fasciae to realign the body in more appropriate relation to gravity, to correct imbalances caused by entrenched muscular contractions, and to open areas of blocked feeling and energy. When treatment is successful, it leads to a general freeing up of the CA, capacity to feel, greater awareness of and sensitivity to one's own physical processes, improved overall coordination, superior balance, and increased energy. Not everyone gains these benefits to the same degree, or at all, but for me it was very much the right treatment at the right time in my development. I felt lighter than I had in years. I experienced a general deepening of self-awareness. I felt freer emo -tionally. I felt as if walls within myself had dissolved. And I had more energy. I was not surprised that I felt better. What did surprise me what I was completely unprepared for was the change in my perceptiveness concerning other people. During this period I was leading a number of psychotherapy groups, and my clients volunteered that they could notice changes in me week by week as the rolfing progressed. I had had very little formal training in working with the body in psychotherapy, yet I found I was now able to read bodies to a new and Aston ishing degree. Slight changes in facial expression or eye movements, shifts of posture, subtle variations in ways of standing or sitting, changes of skin color, alterations in breathing patterns, all suddenly seemed to convey volumes of information to me as clearly as articulate speech. It was as if, in becoming more transparent to myself, I had shifted to a space that allowed others to become more transparent to me. For me, this was something oh, f a revelation. When we are able to see the internal more clearly, we become able to see the external more clearly. What both of these stories are meant to illuminate is that when we are able to see the internal more clearly, we are able to see the external more clearly. Now, by way of completing this discussion of the foundations of living consciously, I want to say a few words about the nature of reason and rationality. Reason, the non-contradictory dot integration of experience. On the morning of the day I began to write this section, I turned on the news while having breakfast, and the first item to come up on the screen was astronaut Jim Lovell being interviewed about his extraordinary experiences on Apollo 13. The film Apollo 13, based on his book, Ost Moon, was about to be released. In a quietly understated way, Lovell told of the explosion of an oxygen tank that turned the mission into a race for survival against one potent, tile catastrophe after another from a rapidly diminishing supply of breathable air to a battery strength insufficient for a return to Earth in a deteriorating spacecraft hurtling through the cosmos to almost certain destruction. What was thrilling about the interview was the sense one got of the magnificent teamwork between the men on board the spacecraft and the support crew on Earth interacting at a height of disciplined intelligence and passionate competence which resulted in the craft and its inhabitants being brought safely home. I thought with acutely painful longing of what it would be like to live in a world in which human beings functioned as a way of life as the people functioned in that crisis. I am referring not necessarily to the speed of response or sense of urgency that characterized that situation, but rather to the level of consciousness, 
rationality, and reliability the individuals involved exhibit. It was a marvel of integrated human efforts made possible only by the intransigent self-responsibility of every participant. I do not know how rational any of those people were in the rest of their lives, but in this situation, reality was an absolute, no one imagined the problem would go away if they simply didn't think about it, reason was an absolute, no one phoned his astrologer for suggestions, and the relationship between rational, ity and survival was understood by all. If one wanted to see the spirituality of reason in action, I thought, this was it. By, spiritual, I mean pertaining to consciousness, as contrasted with, a material, which means pertaining to or constituted of mat, ter, and further, pertaining to the needs and development of con, -siousness. In speaking of, the spirituality of reason, in this context, I wish to draw attention to the very high level at which consciousness is operating when individuals working at breath, stopping speed integrate and apply enormous abstractions from physics, chemistry, physiology, and any number of other sciences to arrive at immediate solutions to devastatingly difficult techno, logical challenges with the result that human beings survived who otherwise would have perished. Among the many crimes committed against the younger generation, one of the worst is that young people are taught next to nothing about reason, rationality, or the importance of critical thinking. In a decent educational system, no one would graduate from high school who had not been taught the basic principles of logic or been trained to recognize logical fallacies. Children need to be taught not what to think but how to think. They need to be educated in the achievements of mind throughout history and help to understand that their ability to reason is what makes them uniquely human. They need help in understanding that their most precious asset is what they carry between their ears. Among the many crimes committed against the younger generation, one of the worst is that young people are taught next to nothing about reason, rationality, or the importance of critical thinking. No other gift to a young person could equal that of teaching the intimate relationship that exists between rationality and self-esteem between consciousness and efficacy. This relationship has been a central theme of my writing for over three decades. If the essence of self-esteem is the experience of being competent to face the challenges of life, and if our mind is our basic tool of survival and of adaptation to reality, then no virtue is nobler or more practical than the appropriate exercise of mind. Life existed on this planet for millions of years before a life form evolved from which, at a certain point in its development, the capacity to reason emerged. As a distinct human faculty and process, reason was identified explicitly and conceptually only about 2,600 years ago, in ancient Greece. Approximately two centa rise later, Aristotle defined man as the rational animal. The definition did not mean that people always behaved rationally. It meant that the ability to reason, at least in its full form, was unique to our species. It was the trait that most distinguished our species from all others and that made it possible to understand the greatest number of our actions and achievements. To be moved by impulses we do not understand is not an exclusively human prerogative, lower animals live this way as a matter of course. But to assess and integrate the messages coming to us from our body, our emotions, our past knowledge, our imagi, nation, external reality, and perhaps the experience of millions who have gone before us is a uniquely human capability called thinking. To have a brain and nervous system that automatically learns to retain and integrate disparate sensations, energy pulsations, so as to make possible the perception of solid objects is not an exclusively human trait, other animals are similarly endowed. But to integrate percepts into concepts, to identify certain aspects of real, ity, grasp the essentials they have in common, and integrate them into wider conceptual categories than to do the same with one's concepts, integrating them into wider concepts or forming certain narrower concepts as subcategories of wider ones, building an increasingly complex structure of knowledge, bringing more and more of reality under the control of one's mind so that one can build skyscrapers, devise sophisticated instruments for medical diagnosis, invent new ways to produce more and better with diminishing expenditures of energy, 
send men to the moon and bring them home safely that is a possibility of our species alone. Through the operation of our rational faculty. One of the unique characteristics of our form of consciousness is that it is self-reflexive meaning that mind can examine its own processes. We can ask, how did I arrive at that conclusion? Do I really know my reasons? Am I being influenced by prejudice? Do I have grounds to believe this is true, or do I merely want it to be true? Am I being logical right now? Do my conclusions really follow from my premises? We can monitor not only our mental operations but virtually any aspect of our existence. We can ask, who am I? What do I want? Where am I going? For what purpose should I live? Are my actions in alignment with that purpose? Am I proud of my choices and decisions? To live con, siously is necessarily to be concerned with such questions, and it is our rational faculty our ability to think, and even to think about thinking that makes such questions possible. A less evolved consciousness does not and cannot question its operations. A dog does not wonder if it is being swayed by inappropriate considerations. A chimpanzee does not ask itself if its goals are rational. Since reason is understood many different ways by people, I need to develop a bit more fully the broad, universal sense in which I use the term. Reason, or rationality, is the faculty that grasps relationships. It is the faculty that makes distinctions and looks for connections, that abstracts and unites, that differentiates and integrates. Reason generates general principles from concrete facts, induction, AP, applies general principles to concrete facts, deduction, and relates new knowledge and information to our existing context of null, edge. Its guide is the law of non-contradiction. Observe that integration is central not only to the operation of mind but to every aspect of the life process. The growth of a fetus into a human being is a series of progressive stages of differentia, tie-in and integration. And any organism, human or otherwise, is a complex integrate of hierarchically organized structures and funk, tie-ins. We sustain ourselves physically by taking materials from the environment, breaking them down, reorganizing them, and achieving a new integration that converts these materials into the means of our survival. We can observe an analogous phenomenon in what we do cognitively. Just as integration is the cardinal princi, PLE of life, so it is the cardinal principle of mind. This principle is operative when, in the brains of humans or animals, sensations are retained and integrated, by nature's, programming, in such a way as to produce a perceptual awareness of entities in awareness that humans and animals require for their survival. Integra, tie-in is at the heart of the process of forming concepts and generating abstract thought that is, the process of gaining knowledge on which distinctively human survival depends. This process, of course, is not automatic. It is volitional in contrast to perception, which is automatic. We must choose to think. At the conceptual level, we must guide and monitor our mental processes. We must check our conclusions against all able evidence that is, we must reason. Point six reason is an evolutionary development. It is the instrument of awareness raised to the conceptual level. It is the power of integra tie-in inherent in life made explicit and self-conscious. Rationality, which is the exercise of reason in judgment and action, should not be confused, as it so often is, with what people of a given time or place represent as the reasonable. Many an innovator has been denounced as unreasonable for refusing to play by someone else's rules or to accept the received wisdom of his or her time. Often, rationality must challenge and reject what others call reasonable. On the most personal level, growing up, a young person of some independence questions many of the views handed out by elders. Why, he or she asks. Why do you say that? What are your grounds, degree and if satisfactory answers are not forthcoming, those views are not accepted merely because others describe them as reasonable. One of the most precious traits of young people is the desire to understand, to make sense of things. 
this is the voice of reason within them. The quest of reason this can hardly be stated often enough is for the non-contradictory integration of experience. Historically, if some notion of the reasonable is overthrown by new evidence or more precise thinking, people sometimes say, so much for reason. But it was the mistaken notion that was overthrown, not reason. Indeed, reason was the instrument of the overthrow. The quest of reason this can hardly be stated often enough is for the non-contradictory integration of experience. This implies one's openness and availability to experience. Reason is the servant neither of tradition nor consensus. This distinction between reason, or rationality, as a process and what some person or group labels, the reasonable, is of the highest importance. Much nonsense about the alleged, inadequacies, of reason is made possible by the failure to make this distinction. It goes without saying that we are fallible. With the best will in the world, we can still make mistakes. But reason in the global sense in which I define it here offers us the possibility of self-correction. That is one of its unique characteristics. Other alleged paths to knowledge, such as faith or feeling, do not share this possibility, that is, they lack an inbuilt self-correcting dynamism. Sometimes they may disclose a truth, sometimes not, but they have no internal means to distinguish, no internal standard by which to detect error or guide the way to its correction. Apart from what we have already observed about our ability to monitor and assess our own mental operations, consider the following, any time we review a plan we have made in our personal life or in business and spot an omission or oversight or unwarranted inference or some other kind of flaw in our thinking, and take steps to revise our plan, reason is operating in itself, correcting mode. Any time we change our mind about something, in response to new evidence or a new argument, thinking is used to revise thinking. Any time we are about to agree to a deal or proposal of some kind, and some signal of discomfort in our body or sense of static in our brain arrests our attention and makes us pause and check further because experience has taught us not to ignore signals of that kind, even if we don't fully understand them. It is an act of rationality that is protecting us and impelling us to look again before we leap. Regarding this last example, the role of reason is not always obvious to people, they may merely tell themselves, I had a hunch. But it is reason that says, based on experience, better check this out, or, if the deal is so great, why do I feel uneasy? There's something here that doesn't compute, something I can't integrate. The practice of living consciously entails an openness to evidence that might suggest an error in one's thinking and a willingness to correct such errors. Further, when we argue for some viewpoint and there is a gap or a flaw in our thinking and someone calls our attention to the error, it is reason that alerts us to the need to rethink our position. When new evidence is incompatible with, cannot be integrated with, our established views, it is reason that tells us we have to go back to the drawing board. If an event transpires that our belief system says is impossible, it is reason that instructs us to re-examine our premises. The practice of living consciously entails an openness to evidence that might suggest an error in one's thinking and a willingness to correct such an error. It is the opposite of self-defensive mental rigid ITY. Defensiveness is unconsciousness protecting itself. If we are in, vested in the fallacious notion that we must never make a mistake or that it is a reflection on our worth to admit an error, then we are driven to shrink our awareness to induce blindness. Living con, siously, and authentic self-esteem, require eagerness to discover one's errors and candor about admitting them. The underlying premise of this attitude is, I do not treat reality as an antagonist. The self-correcting dynamism of reason is not automatic or instantaneous, given the facts of free will, human inertia, and the passion with which reason can be resisted. But eventually, reason and reality win. The progress of science and technology is a monument to this truth. That technology may not always be used wisely or in the service of life is not a failure of reason but a failure in the exercise of reason, reason must be applied to ends, not only to means. 
I am strongly opposed to the notion of instrumental REA, sun which confines rationality to the selection of means while claiming that ends are outside reason. That the gas ovens of Nazi death camps operated efficiently does not make them express science of human rationality. Reason does not permit the ignoring of context that is, considering single events as if they occurred in a vacuum. Indeed, the practice of looking at events in their full context and assessing them accordingly is one of the hallmarks of rationality. With regard to advances in science, note what Jenner, Atesh the need for a new paradigm to replace an older one, the accumulation of new data that simply cannot he integrated into the older model or picture of reality. The battle cry of reason is, integrate, integrate, integrate. The drive to do so is the motor of scientific progress. Of course, it would be a mistake to identify reason exclusively with science. Science is the rational, systematic study of the facts of reality, its aim is to discover laws of nature, to achieve a comprehensive, integrated knowledge that will make the universe intelligible. Science is an expression of reason, but it is not equivalent in meaning. Reason is the broader, more inclusive concept. One can be rational without being scientific witness the everyday think ing we do that keeps our life flowing, such as meeting the chow lungs of our job or understanding, through conversation, aspects of one another's inner worlds. To recognize the profoundly important role of reason in our lives is not to imply that reasoning is our only useful or legitimate mental activity. Fantasizing daydreaming, creative mental playfulness, meditative self-observation, contemplative practices, non-lin, ear, non-verbal forms of right hemisphere, cognition all have profoundly useful roles, serve important purposes, and represent appropriate operations of mind. But it takes an act of thought to know when to let go of purposeful thinking and shift to another mode of mental functioning. And it is a function of reason to check the results of our mental operations against the full context of our knowledge. Precisely because its task is integration, reason is the ultimate umpire. As philosopher Mortimer J. Adler rightly observes, O oh, fall the serious misfortunes that can befall us while we're alive and not threatened by terminal illness, the most grievous is loss of mind or, more specifically, loss of our intellectual power our power of rational thought. Deprivation off sight or hearing, partial paralysis of muscles, loss of limbs, even the conceptual blindness that is agnosia all these misfortunes, however disabling, still allow us to live on the distinctly human plane but deprived of our intellectual minds, we are deprived over humanity. Seven many misunderstandings surround the idea of reason, and it is not possible to address them all here. But there are one or two more observations I need to make. Many years ago, I noticed that when I wish to deepen my understanding of my client's feelings and emotional context, if I sit as my client is sitting, breathe as my client is breathing, and imagine myself somehow spiritually merging with my client, even though I cannot fully explain in words just how I am doing this, I find myself understanding the client in a new and deeper way, as evidenced by the insights that occur to me and by the responses I elicit. You but isn't this a non-rational form of knowledge, call, leagues have asked me. My answer is, not at all. I have never asserted that all our ideas can come to us only through a process of reasoning. Einstein, for example, spoke of the role of muscle sense in his theorizing. Nor have I ever insisted that we already possess full and comprehensive knowledge of all the ways in which one can access information about the universe. But it is reason, it is reality testing, that can convert these possible insights into knowledge. We need reality testing to verify that our insights represent facts. One of the meanings of jiving consciously is, pay attention to what works, and do more of it, and try to understand the principles involved. And also, pay attention to what doesn't work, and stop doing it regarding the process I describe with clients in therapy, I can explain in part why it tends to be successful, but I cannot explain it entirely not to my satisfaction. However, if I discover time and again that the method yields deeper awareness of my client's inner state, as confirmed by the client's feedback, 
then it is utterly rea, sonable to use this method as a tool. I do not assume it is infallible but, rather, continue to check its accuracy through further dialogue and observation. It is reasonable to use a method that has a record of producing worthwhile results, even if we cannot account fully for why the method works. For thousands of years, people used folk remedies without understanding how or why they worked, and it would have been irrational not to, after observing the remedy's effectiveness. One of the meanings of living consciously is, pay attention to what works, and do more of it, and try to understand the princey, please involved. And also, pay attention to what doesn't work and stop doing it. Reason and emotion, challenging the necessity for conflict. One misunderstanding concerning reason has haunted mankind virtually since reason was first identified, and that is the relation of reason to emotion. A long tradition sees thought and feeling as adversaries. Traditionally, from the time of ancient Greece, the champions of thought saw emotions as wild horses that reason must subdue and control while champions of feeling saw a reason as a repressive force that obstructed the deep wisdom of blood and heart. As we will see later in this book, both these views are wrong, and both undermine the practice of living consciously. Living consciously requires a rejection of this dichotomy and the mistaken premises underlying it. Living consciously entails the attainment of a wider field of vision that permits reason and emo, tie-in to be integrated rather than mutually opposed. We will see that to feel honestly and deeply is to liberate the process of thinking clearly. To think clearly is to create a context for a passionate life. To live consciously is to rise above the view of the human spirit as a battlefield of conflicting forces and to see not war but harmony as the natural condition of an enlightened mind. To choice and responsibility. For many years, my wife Devers and I had a running problem that I failed to resolve. In the morning, when I made myself toast and coffee, I often spilled coffee on the kitchen floor. Not noticing I had done so, I did not clean it up. Devers would periodically point this out to me and ask me to be more careful. I would promise to do so and genuinely felt I had earnest intentions but somehow I kept spilling coffee. At times I was flabbergasted when this was pointed out to me, I could not understand how or why it kept happening, despite my resolutions to be careful. We had many discussions on this subject, some of them warm and friendly, but not all. I liked drinking coffee out of a mug, disliked bothering with saucers, and could not for the life of me understand why it was so difficult to balance the mug as I kept explaining to an increasingly frustrated and baffled Devers. The problem became acute when we built a new home and now had a much finer kitchen, with a white floor and white grouting. Cleaning coffee stains out of grouting can be a project, as I was to discover. One day I was sitting at my computer when I heard Devers calling from the kitchen, Nathaniel. Pointing to coffee stains on the kitchen floor, Devers asked, in a tone of exasperation, is there any reason why it is I who should clean this up? Absolutely not, darling, I answered. Th take care of it. On my knees with a damp sponge, I struggled to remove the stains from the grouting and finally remarked, gee, this is hard. There's cleanser under the sink, Devers answered. As I went to work with the cleanser, I heard Devers saying to my back, I really don't know what to do about this. It's so frustrating. We've had a million conversations, and it keeps happening. Once again I proceeded to tell her how bewildered I was that the problem was still with us, no matter how often I told myself to be careful. I did not learn until later that while Devers watched me, on my hands and knees, removing the last of the coffee stains, she was trying hard not to laugh. I thought she was still angry and that she was quite justified. Then her expression changed to one of humor and triumph, and she announced, I know how we're going to solve this. I'm going to adapt a technique I once saw Nathaniel Brandon use in psychotherapy. When I heard that, I knew I was in trouble. Are we agreed, she asked me. That you should not spill coffee? I answered, of course. And are we agreed, she went on, that you are physically able not to spill coffee? 
Again, I said, of course. Devers then said, okay, I want your word that any time I find spilt coffee on the floor, you will owe me $500. $500. Isn't that extreme? So is your spilling coffee for 17 years. Through a long moment of silence I stared at the knowledge that she was absolutely right and that what she was proposing was reasonable. I felt that in all logic and justice I had to shake her hand on this deal. Back in my office, with a rising sense of desperation, I thought that now I really had to solve this problem. I could not afford to pay Devers $3,500 a week for the luxury of being absent-minded, sometimes this is a polite word for semi-unconscious. So I asked myself questions I had not thought of asking myself before, why did I spill my coffee? What made not spilling it so difficult? And suddenly the answer was clear to me, I spilt coffee because I always filled the cup to the very top. If I only filled the cup to the three-quarters mark, it would be simple to avoid spilling coffee. And since I never drink more than half a cup anyway. From that day, I stopped spilling coffee. The moral of the story is, there is operating consciously and there is operating consciously. Certainly I would have said I was being adequately conscious in my efforts to solve the spilt cough fee problem. But when suddenly the stakes for failing were raised to another level, my efforts acquired a new urgency and I d wrecked a more intense awareness at the problem than I previously had done. I had been conscious, of course, but I became more con -cious. Do I take responsibility for generating a level of awareness appropriate to the context? Do I give my activities the best consciousness of which I am capable, or do I settle for something less than that? At my earlier level of consciousness, I wanted to solve the problem, no doubt, but at some level I was willing for the problem not to be solved immediately, the determination to correct the situation was less than absolute. When the determination became absolute, I raised my consciousness and found the solution. For the reader who is curious as to what Devers might have done differently at the very beginning to prevent this problem from remaining unresolved so long, I will add the following, if I had been consulted about such a problem, would have suggested to the wife, after her first few discussions with her husband failed to produce a change in his behavior, that she stop cleaning up after him and that instead she call him into the kitchen and say simply, here is a spilt coffee spot. That needs cleaning up. I promise you he would have stopped spilling coffee in much less than 17 years. However, to return to the incident as it actually happened, what I had to be willing to look at later, and this was challenging, was the fact that the knowledge that I was agitating Devers with my spilt coffee was not evidently a powerful enough motivator in itself to generate change. So I was drawn down to a deeper level of self-examination on this score. The point here is that consciousness can operate at higher and lower levels of clarity and intensity, and in any given situation, the question is not whether I am conscious or not in the literal sense but whether I bring to the occasion the level of consciousness I require to be effective. Or, to put it another way, do I take responsibility for generating a level of awareness appropriate to the context? The example I have given is mundane. But the principle involved is the same whether the issue is as basic as not spilling coffee or as complex as raising children, running a corporation, or writing a book. Do we give our activities the best consciousness of which we are capable, or do we settle for something less than that? The question of living consciously would not even arise if we did not have the power, within limits, to regulate the activity of our mind that is, if consciousness were not volitional. A being whose consciousness functioned automatically would not need to be advised to live consciously. No alternative would be perceived to exist. A dog is, in effect, programmed by nature to use its senses optimally. We are not programmed to use our minds optimally. We may or may not choose to do the thinking our goals and well-being require. The decision is left to us. The ability to focus our mind or not to, to think or not to, to strive for awareness or not to, to face reality or not to, is our free will. To live consciously, 
we must understand the nature of our choice in the matter that is, our freedom and responsibility one ity. Free will, the choice to turn consciousness brighter or dimmer. The essence of our psychological freedom may be summarized as follows, we are free to focus our mind, or not to bother, or to actively avoid focusing. We are free to think, or not to bother, or to actively avoid thinking. We are free to strive for greater clarity with regard to some issue confronting us, or not to bother, or to actively seek darkness. We are free to examine unpleasant facts or to evade them. The process of focusing our mind consists, in effect, of giving ourselves the order, in relation to some issue, grasp this. Sup, pose, for example, we face a desktop full of work needing to be completed, and initially we are in a somewhat vague and poorly focused mental state. Then we sigh, take a deep breath, pick up some document, and in effect tell ourselves, grasp this. See where you left off, recreate your context, grasp what the situation now requires and proceed. In that instant, we shift into clearer focus and higher consciousness. The choice to think is the choice to rise from the sensory perceptual level and the awareness of moods, feelings, or floating mental images to the active, conceptual level of consciousness. Everyone is familiar with experiences of this kind just as if everyone is familiar with the opposite experience, where we elect to remain in an unfocused state and avoid the reality confronting us and also avoid thinking about the consequences of our avoidance. The choice to think is the choice to rise from the sensory, perceptual level and the awareness of moods, feelings, or floating mental images to the active, conceptual level of consciousness. In other words, it is the choice to pursue some goal entailing different, tiation and integration, abstraction and concretization so as to gain increased mastery over some domain of concern to us. The choice not to bother, or to actively avoid thinking, is the choice to remain stuck at the level of sensory awareness and pa, sieve feeling in relation to whatever it is we are not dealing with. In such a case, we evade the fact that something requires our attention and we drift mentally, resort to alibis and rationalize a, tie-ins, change the subject, or get suddenly sleepy seeking one escape route or another away from the challenge we do not choose to face. Consider a situation at work where someone tells us of a prob-lem in OU our organization. Suppose we do not want the responsibility of having to deal with it, even though that responsibility is prop early hours. So at first we have great difficulty understanding what is being said to us, then in remembering it, then in grasping what needs to be done. Artfully, we summon not clarity but confusion into our consciousness. Confusion is our defense against thought and responsibility. Or the problem might not concern work but, rather, our marriage or an issue with our children and we prefer to avoid rather than confront so we call on the same strategy of self-induced confusion. In the workplace and our personal life, this strategy is common. If we are aware of this pattern and wish to break out of it, the most relevant question to ask is, what am I pretending not to know? Asking that question implies, of course, that we have already begun shifting to a clearer, more focused level of consciousness and this is an act of choice. In any situation we confront the issue, shall I or shall I not strive for awareness, clarity, understanding? And the way we build confidence in our mind and gain increasing control over our life is by repeatedly responding in the affirmative. We make a muscle strong by using it. We make a mind strong the same way. This point is essential to learning how to grow in self-esteem. However, Consciousness is necessarily selective. We cannot be aware of everything. The choice to focus in one direction is, in effect, the choice not to focus in other directions. The choice to think about one subject is the choice, in that moment, not to think about something else. If I am listening to what you are saying, I am choosing to screen out the conversation at the next table or the traffic sounds from the street. If I suddenly hear an explosion outside the restaurant, I may orient my attention toward the outside and withdraw my attention from our conversation. 
This leads us to the issue of consciousness and context. 